Thank you. That's me. Um, it's a puppet of myself. Was that made for promotional reasons? Uh, it was a project I did when I was still in school in like my second year and he kind of got stowed away. He was like a little performance piece that I used and I kind of forgot about him. And then while all the book promo stuff was happening, I thought, oh, this would be a good time to bring him back out. And so I, he had gotten a bit beat up. So I refurbished him and I did some surgery on him. Oh, okay. Uh, so now he's good as new again. Is that your apartment that you're in? or? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I'm not going to show you this half. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, <laughs> but this is kind of my home studio. There you go. Wow. That's a hell of a desk. Thank you. You know, I found this on uh, Craigslist for $100 like seven years ago. And that's probably the object that I've spent most of my time with in my life so far. Yeah, well, $100 uh, Canadian, that's like $120 US. So. It was, well, it was while I was in uh, in Baltimore, actually. I, was, I, oh. I went to school at Micah there, so yeah. Wait, what school did you go to? Uh, Maryland Institute. I, I think uh, if you know, do you know closed caption comics like um, Noel and uh, and uh, 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 Lane Milbourne yeah, and sure. Connor Sichel? They all went there as well, so that's Were the... they ahead of you? They were by probably like, I think five years or something like that. But actually Connor came in, uh, one of my teachers brought him in to do like a talk and he was like, yeah, you should go talk to Sammy. So we, we kind of had a connection there, so. Mm -hmm. And you, you went to school for painting, right? Is that what? Uh, the program I was in was like drawing. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty open-ended, but it was like a fine arts program. It wasn't like as much focused on illustration, which is, Funny because now I'm I'm doing more commercial stuff, but I mean I guess that's mostly just for work. I, I liked it from a from a comics perspective. I think if I went into illustration, I might not be getting like the same feedback that I wanted to get. You know, like an illustrator doing comics is a different kind of vibe sometimes. So yeah, you can always tell when. It's yeah, exactly. Comics. When did you start getting into comics? Um, I, I mean, it depends on how far back you want to search, but like I started out writing prose fiction. So I was like, uh, I, until I was like 20. So I was a kid and I, I was really interested in fiction. Uh, but then around when I was like 16, I kind of discovered, you know, probably the first things that I was reading were like the best American comics things. And uh, Kramer's was really big at that time. I think there was that one Kramer's with the blue cityscape kind of cover. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was I I got that from the library and it like blew my mind. Uh, so that was like the first introduction. And then around 20, I, I just didn't think that I could draw at that time because I didn't really have any experience drawing or doing visual art. So then around when I was 20, I switched gears and decided I wanted to be making comics. So I went to art school and did that whole thing and taught myself or got taught how to make art, I guess. <laughs> well, it makes sense though, because I, I could tell that you were more of a writer. Like you, you know, I could tell that you come from that background from reading your work. Yeah. It is very literate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There were no misspellings there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I try and like temper it. I don't want it to feel too like that's something that I kind of try and push pull with like uh, I don't want it to feel too dense sometimes but then at the same time my instinct is just to make everything as, as dense and literary as possible so what were like when you were getting into comics so like was it specifically like the kinds of comics that would have been in Kramer's like more artsy stuff or do yeah. you know like a, yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, I think I was like also it wasn't until I got to college and actually like Connor introduced me to a lot of the alt alt scene. I mean, I feel like back then there was sort of a hegemony of the established, you know, I mean, that, and I love them all, but it was like Chris Ware, Daniel Klaus, like Adrian Tomine uh, or 
Tom, I'm not quite sure how to say his last name, actually, Tom and Nair. Uh, and uh, uh, Ben Catchor, all those folks were pretty big on uh, influences on me. Um, I mean, it's like kind of cliche now, but like Chris Ware, I, I really took to heart as a kid because I was really focused on the structural kind of vibe that he was going for and making everything really intricate and having the panel layouts kind of echo everything. And I think I still kind of work with that a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, although I, my work looks pretty different from his, so. Yeah, yeah. there was more of a canon back then. Uh, yeah, and now it's like super flourishing in every direction. Like it's impossible to keep track of everybody who's making work, uh, which is exciting. There's no equivalent to the Village Voice to publish your yeah. weekly old comics anymore. Mm -hmm. Even when I was like starting out, like the whole Vice Comics thing was really useful for me to get a footing in the industry. Uh, and I feel like that sort of was carrying the torch of that kind of periodical for mm -hmm. a lot of people like Anya Davidson got her start in there and uh, uh, Margot Farrick and uh, mm -hmm. Tara Booth and all these people. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, after I got like six stories in, uh, uh, the art director there, Nick Gazin, was like, oh, yeah, they, they cleaned house and they don't have comics anymore. And now it's all gone. Oh, is that so, what happened? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. They had a massive downsizing and they decided that the comics weren't making them any money, I think. I mean, don't quote me like you'd have to ask him. Um, but similarly, like, you know, I, I had that thing in Best American in 2017, and then like two years later or three years later now, it's it's out of business as well. <laughs> yeah, you're just killing so. things. As you, you made it into now, and that seems like it's going pretty strong, so. Yeah, I guess, uh, and that would be the natural, I guess, uh, you know, next iteration of, of Moam, which is also was like uh, a good starting ground for a lot of people, like that Shaw. I think his first stuff got got into there. Yeah, me too. That's where I came from. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's right. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's uh, now is important. That's a really. I mean, that's where I discovered you. Was in now. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we were in the same uh, issue, which I was excited about. Yeah. I I find out like about what artists I should be following mostly from it now. Yeah, like, Eric's uh, so great. Like he's got such a great keen eye. And uh, I think what's happening at Fantagraphics is really cool. Like, I think for a while with Fantagraphics and Drawn and Quarterly and all these big powerhouses, uh, they were sort of not looking outside that canon for a little while. And right. then it seems like there's a new wave where they're kind of reaching their tendrils out into all these small alt comic scenes and kind of finding new artists. Like, I think the way Eric got a hold of my work was through Simon and Jack uh so i think they've been really good at scouting people and yeah. finding out yeah i know i know that they are and same with like rj casey when he was there he was really good yes. at scouting talent right now even like now that the book is out i'm kind of not obviously i mean i feel like i'm obsessed with comics like it's kind of like my whole heart and soul is inside of it so i'm not quitting but like i i, I am trying to do more commercial work and more illustration now and just to get that ball rolling and then yeah, I can yeah. do them both concurrently. How's that, how's that going, by the way, getting commercial work, like illustration? It's going work. pretty well, yeah. I mean, and I'm selling a lot more art this year since the book came out as well, original stuff. So that's good. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's like a snowball and I feel like I'm just past the first stage where mm -hmm. it's kind of starting to build up now. So that's, that's my focus for this year. Here in Canada, we got all this free money this year because of COVID. Uh -huh. And I hate to, to say that because I know the situation was not as fun <laughs> in the States. Yeah. So it was a good cushion for me to be actually to be able to finish the book mm -hmm. and then now to kind of have some time to flesh out a portfolio and kind of reach out a little more. Yeah, um, I think I think that's what's great about comics is that anybody working in it, you know, they're they're doing it because they're really passionate about what they're doing because there's not going to be much reward from society apart from you know recognition from your peers and, and your readership which is amazing um but i mean it to me it says that no matter how much infrastructure there is or lack thereof or how much it disappears over time uh there's still going to be people like making their their shit and and getting it out there which is kind of heartwarming i guess yeah yeah um yeah. 
some of the stuff I really want to know about you is, is mostly like how things happen. I think it's like interesting because you're like still at the stage where things are actually just now starting to happen. Like this yeah. is it. Like when you have your first book out, this is like the most exciting part. Actually, the most exciting part is when that book first arrives and then you open it and it's like your first. That was pretty exciting. Yeah. 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 So can I ask, how did you get in Vice? Like how did that happen? Well, I actually just cold called Nick Gazin, actually, <laughs> cold, cold emailed. And I was going to New York because I, uh, I'm i sort of a, a David Hockney stan. Like, I'm, a, I'm obsessed with David Hockney. And they had that giant retrospective uh, at the Met. So I my plan was basically to go down and hopefully get in touch with a bunch of art directors. And Nick was somebody I reached out to for illustration work in, to, in the beginning. And then I said, you know, I have comics too. And he actually didn't get back to me at all. And then, and then I like went into his Instagram and I like spam liked every single one of his posts for like a year. And then later that, like within an hour, he was like, you know, I, I love the comics you sent me. And then I sent him more. I dropped it. I dropped some off with him in person at the vice offices, which were like the weirdest uh environment you can ever enter it's like the prototypical hipster haven with like a billiard table and a cocktail lounge and a, and they wouldn't let me get past the front door but i gave it to the receptionist and i gotta guess it got to him so <laughs> yeah so that was that was the vice connection um and then you and, were self you were just self-publishing your your mini comics and going to shows and stuff like that and yeah, yeah. Like I started the first thing, which is in the book as well. The first thing I self-published was The Dead Father. Yeah. And it didn't really go anywhere for like a year and a half or two years, actually. And then um, I submitted it to, which one thing that was really great about Best American is they were pretty democratic and like you basically could mail anything in mm -hmm. that you wanted to. So um, Bill got a hold of it there. And he uh, was working with Ben Catcher at the time, who I didn't even know who the guest editor would be. And like when I found out it was Ben, I was like, ah. <laughs> so Ben liked it, I guess, and put it in uh, the anthology. And that I think got a few more eyes on it. And by that time, I had self published a few more floppies. And then uh, the Doug Wright Awards, which are this. Yeah. Uh, like Canadian award for comics. They do like three a year through TCAF uh, is presented every year. So they, I guess, saw the dead father in best American and then, and then gave it that award. Uh, so I think if like, I was, a, I mean, I, I can empathize with your self portrait character working at Starbucks and like, <laughs> and like feeling disheartened and like, when will someone notice my great? <laughs> So yeah. I think that came along at the the right time to kind of push me to keep going. I even I think I I was working in an art supply store and I think I said to my coworker I was like you know this is not going great and if if something doesn't happen in the next year then I'm quitting and then, <laughs> and I'm gonna do something else. And she was like no don't do that. And then like a month later you know the ball started rolling. So that was kind of the start. I, I love that man because i did the same thing i always you know yeah. early on when i was like i'm gonna get i'm gonna try and be a cartoonist i didn't have any i don't have any talent it doesn't come naturally for me and i felt like okay well i'm just gonna give this my best shot and and i told myself like if every if, if after the end of the year if i can look back on what happened to me as a cartoonist and it didn't if it didn't improve or get better in some way that i noticed during that year I'm just going to say fuck it and go do something else. Yeah. I'm going to take that as a sign that this is not for me. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, like every year I'd like look back and like take account of like, what, oh, you know, like I got something published in this or whatever. That's pretty great. Or, yeah. you know, and then, then I would just keep going. I think it's, it's encouraging. Yeah. That, you know? yeah. It's like um, I had a, when I was in uh, high school, I was on the, like the improv team, uh, which was fun. And I had a, a teacher who's his whole philosophy, we would like go compete in these like, improv games it was pretty casual but his whole philosophy was play to play again you know mm -hmm. so if you can get to the next round then you succeeded like you're not trying to win the world championships but like every piece of encouragement that you get really kind of pushes you to kind of keep the ball rolling which is nice yeah that's so funny man because that's like a it, you have all these um um things that like if you throw them together in a pot like it makes a, a perfect cartoonist like a 
like the drawing and art stuff and then like improv and then like being really into literature or whatever like you throw that all into a pod it like makes like a perfect cartoonist oh thank you very much yeah i mean yeah it's i think about that a lot like that uh, there's that one story the idiot where he talks about the art making machine and i think every artist has their own elements that they bring in and like they you know a lot of people most of their career will focus on some of the same themes and develop them over time mm -hmm. uh and so it's nice to have that kind of fusion of different elements inside mm -hmm. yes yeah, that said uh you should not shy away from like like say for example you 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 do another book right and then you look back on that book and it's the same themes yeah you, sh you should never be like i'm repeating myself i need to go back i need to figure out some other road to go on seth is like if you're repeating yourself it's because it's something you need to work out in your life you know it's yeah. in your head you need to yeah. just double down on those themes and keep going because totally. it's obviously something that's really important for you totally you never worry about that or like what what the world is looking for from you just just keep going with you know whatever it's yeah i'm very i'm very much about that like i feel like whenever i choose to write about something a lot of the time it just pops into my head and most of the time it's some it's themes in my life that are bothering me yeah. or that I'm thinking about a lot or that I'm noticing all the time. And the more you pay attention, it's kind of like a bonsai tree. Like the more you pay attention and you clip at it and it gets denser and more complicated and you discover more about it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I definitely feel that. Yeah. 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 And the Doug Wright award, they just like, did you were you there for that when you actually won the award yes luckily um so this was before COVID, i guess so people could actually congregate in a massive environment with tons of other people yeah. um yeah and i didn't even actually i did not reach out to them or submit to them at all they kind of just they emailed me and asked for my work and i was like ah so uh i wasn't sure you know whether it was going to go through or not and uh and then they kind of like sent me like a hint email they were like, hey, are you going to be at the ceremony? It would be really great if you were there. <laughs> I was like, I mean, I live in Toronto, which is a blessing because TCAF is here every year. Yeah, I love that show. It's great. It's, I judged yeah. the the uh, Doug Wright Awards in 2020. Oh, I was, nice. I was supposed to go to the show for it and everything. Yeah. They canceled it. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 One of the best shows, I think, is TCAF yeah i i love it i'm blessed like when i was back in baltimore i was at spx every year obviously because that's in bethesda right next door mm -hmm. um and i while i was there i was always like pining like oh i wonder what tcaf is like it seems so cool and now that i'm here it's like such a blessing to be able to and to connect with all the people organizing it like uh you know i love uh uh, uh jeanette, jeanette la palm's work oh, yeah. you know we've talked uh, and she's putting me in the wowie zonk section which is really nice of her so it's a great community as well yeah 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 uh spx like would you go around and, and like give your mini comics to pantographics yeah. Yeah. Well, I I don't I wasn't smart enough to actually go after the publishers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't think about that for some reason, but I, I handed them out to other artists and uh you know, I didn't actually give him my work. So the the like I said, um Simon got my stuff to Eric or to well, actually I think the the pipeline was Simon gave my stuff to Jack or she discovered it through him mm -hmm. and Jack gave it to Eric, the associate publisher at Fanta um and that was just through basically what happened was it was spx and i hadn't even uh, self-published the floppy yet but i just like came up to simon and i was like i'm like your biggest fan which i am i like he's like my favorite artist basically mm -hmm. um and i was like oh we we got to chatting and i was like oh i wish i had brought a joint for us to smoke and uh he was like well if you bring one i'll smoke it with you so the next day i came back uh with my partner at the time and we just like smoked a joint outside the marriott hotel <laughs> and he signed my books and uh shortly after that he started following my stuff on instagram and then yeah so that was a good connection i mean i there was a lot of false starts like i gave stuff to a few people uh that didn't really go anywhere but yeah i was really lucky that that simon took a shining to it actually because he's been really helpful and yeah supportive what about Andy Brown? How did he discover your, your books? He your came out, uh, up to me at TCAF at my table the day after the, the, the Doug Wright Award thing happened. Of course. So, 
Yeah. yeah. And he basically was just like, do you want to do a book? And uh, I ended up spending like another three years on it, which uh, is, I don't <laughs> regret. <laughs> yeah, I read that about you. You're like a really slow artist. Yeah, I'm really slow. And I, I don't know, I want to work that way. I like making things really dense and mm -hmm. I like kind of packing as much in as possible. The other thing is like, you know, uh, and I, I, I don't necessarily agree with this about your work, but you said you're, you're, you feel like you're not talented. It's like I drawing for me is like a labor. Like I am really trying to finesse what I'm doing a lot of the time. And if I don't always keep I like, I feel like more like an athlete about it. I always am trying to keep practicing and keep my hand as in it as possible. Uh, so that adds a lot of time. Also, my writing process, like, and the, the planning process, I'm getting better at improvising and just working a lot of stuff out on the page. Yeah. But most of the time I'll spend like, when I did the story for now, I was working on other things at the same time, but it did take me almost two years. And then uh, for like a 16 page story, but like, if you see the stack of drawings that was like f condensed into 16 pages, it's like this thick. <laughs> Not the worst. You think like, look at this story I'm making. I'm, this is really piling up. And then you see it printed and it's like printed on like newsprint. And it's double sided. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 have a friend, I have a friend here uh, who's a, a, an artist in Toronto, Ms. Ahmed, and she was like, yeah, I don't, I'm not making zines anymore because you just like put so much work into it and you pour your heart and your soul into it and then somebody buys it at your 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 table and like rips it in half in front of you and like throws it on the ground and steps on it and then shits on it and lights it on fire. <laughs> yeah, that's terrible. Yeah. I <laughs> Yeah. So how do you decide like what style you're going to use? Because you have like a few different styles. At least maybe it's just because this book is a collection of everything. Yeah. Well, I mean, I like what I tell people is like I kind of get bored pretty easily. Like, which is funny because I spend like a long time on each story, but I really like to play around. And part of it is that I just feel like as soon as I've worked on something and I kind of feel like I've figured it out to the degree that I want to. I, I'm not interested in like staying in that zone and just finessing that further. I kind of want to just try something else. Like I had a, a teacher in school who was like looking at my work and he was like, you have a multiple personality disorder or something like that, which when I was starting out with illustration was a big uh, issue because they really want you to brand yourself and just work with the exact same type of drawing every time. But I think with comics, like, it's really not like that. I think that it's such a collage like medium in the first place. And it's so like staccato and you can take so many different elements and like cram them together. And then once you polish the final drawings, they all are cohesive, even though they're taking all these different influences and, and merging them together. Mm -hmm. um, but mo if I, if, in terms of trying to decide what style I'm using, like a lot of the time, uh, I kind of just try and match it with the tone of, of what I'm working yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like I, I, I was doing that American Psycho story in there and it was like all collage. Um, and I kind of wanted it to look like like a ransom note or something like that. Uh, like everything is pieced together. Um, and then, you know, there's a, a bit of it is just wanting to try and fix things that I, I don't like about my work. Like when I did the dead father, I, and I, I loved what I did, but I could realize that it's like, it's so dense that a lot of people are going to get scared off by it and not actually penetrate it. So the next oh, thing that's, I did, So that really worries me to hear you say that. Oh, really? I don't think it's that dense. And actually I think it's like a really inviting read. Oh, cool. Good. You know, like, I got really sucked into that. I think that's probably my favorite story in the book. You know? Oh, thank you. Um, and and so that scares me because then I think because I do a lot of dense work, yes. I'll just like cram like twelve panels on a page or whatever. Yes. I really totally. hope it's not like that, man. I don't know. I I don't feel that way. Like I'll read my own work and I'll be like, yeah, this is great. But <laughs> but I think I don't know. I don't know. Like I can't put myself in the reader's brain really. But I I wonder if uh, they feel like it's too much work the thing is like i don't know it's just because we're making comics you know if you made something really dense and it was like a poem 
and somebody had to look up every other word, nobody would bat an eyelash. They would say, this is like a work of ambition and I want to pay attention to it and give it the time that it deserves. But because comics have that kind of, uh, you know, everybody talks about trying to get out of the comics ghetto, uh, that sort of juvenile tinge to them, which I try, try to embrace and I like, uh, I think it like people aren't used to it sometimes. I wonder if they are or not. Yeah. yeah. Is it the, the comic that you did that's like the COVID diary? Was that for Instagram? Yeah, basically, um, I was just trying to, well, what happened was I got, I got COVID right at the start of, uh, the pandemic. So I think the who declared the pandemic was on, on March 15th. And I had up until that point been working as a ticket agent at the Toronto international film festival. So I had on March 20th, I was like, oh fuck, I have COVID. (laughs) Uh, yeah it was scary uh and it lasted a long time it wasn't awful like i didn't feel like uh like on my deathbed or anything um but it it lasted almost like two and a half months where i had to take it easy oh my god yeah it sucked but uh i came out all right and i kind of just wanted something quick to focus on like there wasn't too much work and that i could get in front of people um because i felt like I couldn't really focus on anything really difficult at that time. Yeah. So those comics were a bit looser. The other thing that was appealing is that like every single person in the world was online at that time. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it got a lot of reach and people saw it in a way they probably wouldn't have if, if it was released now or, you know, before the pandemic. And it so. was drawn on a, a computer, I think. Yeah, so I'm I'm getting more into a little bit of digital work now. Almost like probably ninety percent of the work in the book is is traditional. Um, the only thing that is not traditional in some of the stories is when I have the the ink drawings and the gouache colors. Uh, what I do is like scan them both and superimpose them in Photoshop, and then I cheat and do a little bit of registration with the clone stamp and stuff yeah yeah but for the most part i was obsessed with traditional and i never wanted to touch a computer i think that's changing now i'm more interested uh in making work a little faster as well like i i am i'm improving my craft so i work faster but i'm also trying to change my process so that i can speed things up a little bit so there's more digital coloring and then that one and just a couple things i posted on instagram recently are more uh like the line work is on a cintiq as well mm-hmm. yeah 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 I, that's that's i could always tell though you know um but actually i like that you were working practical like i hope you don't yeah. completely abandon no it. i think i'm gonna stay stay with that well one thing is like i like to have two streams i read robert crumb talking about this before as well where he has like his he called it his hack style and uh, he would, <laughs> and he would do things really quickly to just get them out there. Yeah, and I yeah. like being able to do that. But yeah. then I also like to to focus on one project for a long time and kind of make sure it's exactly a perfect object, exactly how I want it to be too. Yeah. When you when this book comes out, or when it when it came out, were you thinking like, or do you think about your work as something that's going to exist for a long time? Like people will be. You know, I always like have this delusion about actually I'm getting over this now, but I used to have this delusion about like my books coming out and then like children, like my grandchildren would find it, you know, and be like, oh, this is grandpa's book, you know, <laughs> now, now I feel like it's just like that's all this stuff is just going to be like in a dumpster. Nobody cares. But you now- know, I would love that. Like I, I, I would love for it to stick around. I mean, I think that, you know, any artist ideally is trying to make work i don't know i i i I heard about i was reading an interview with this uh rapper danny brown and he was talking about how a lot of uh other musicians that he saw were just trying to get you know the likes and the views and have things happen really quickly and get that instant gratification and he was saying that what he was working on was a legacy and like i think that's an interesting distinction like i definitely I'm not trying to work for instant gratification because I'm obviously like not getting gratified instantly. <laughs> but I, I I don't know. I mean, I don't. I think it also can get in your way if you're trying to like 
grasp at like it, you know it's the insurmountable mountains of greatness you know like you kind of have to have a balance i guess so it would be great if people were still reading my work in 100 years but uh i also don't even know that anyone uh, who is human will be alive on earth in 100 years so <laughs> are you working on like another uh, book right now do you do you take any breaks between stuff well, I sort of had to take a break after this book. Like I had two commissions that were pretty big after I finished, I handed in the book to Andy. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point- in like a, a, like a, a single, like a painting or like a illustration? Oh no, like illustration stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I finished, I handed the book in in January and I was just like demolished. I was so, nobody tells you that like, publishing a book like nearly kills you. I didn't realize that. <laughs> so I was destroyed. And then I had another two months of like intense labor to do after that. So by the, I'm trying to get out of this cycle, but basically I just like overwork and then like crash. And then I have a burnout recovery period. And then I kind of scale back up again. Uh, I'm trying to do a little better at like making the work-life balance better. Mm -hmm. um, but I do have plans for another book already. And the, but they're, the themes are sort of nebulous. I don't know exactly what shape it's going to take, but I sort of have three stories and I think I might either put them together in one book as separate entities that are connected, or I might just make them into one like long graphic novel. Yeah. There is a pressure, you know, to make the long graphic novel. That's what everybody seems yeah. to want. Yeah. Is that what yeah. You, yeah, I think you're right. Like they, the short story collection is tough. Like um, I think Adrian Tomei was like that. Like he always worked in short stories, but then he was constantly getting pressure to do like one long narrative. And so the only way he could do that was to break it up in issues of optic nerve. And that was shortcomings, which is like one of the only, I think I'm, I think the, it was like the only uh, fiction, long fiction he's ever done. Yes. Those shortcomings. Yeah. And for me, it's like, all of the fiction writers that I revere are, are often short story writers. Like that's oh, really? what I'm interested in. Yeah. And that's the sort of work that I want to make. Like I, I don't, I won't even read a novel that's over. I mean, okay. I'm lying right now. Cause I'm reading two like 900 page novels, but like most of the time I don't touch anything that's over 200 pages. Cause I'm just like, it's not the sort of work that I'm interested in making, I guess. Yeah. Um, but having said that, I'm, I'm, always experimenting stylistically. So I think I can be convinced to kind of try that out. Um, yeah. So, I don't know. so could you do one? Could you tell a story that was 100 pages long? Or does that seem like a giant mountain? I feel like I'm becoming more interested in, in working like that lately. Mm -hmm. But uh, it does feel like if I tried to scale something like that, I think I'd, if I did something like that, it would be probably closer to like 120 or 140 or 50. Yeah. And it would probably take like, a couple years or three years so i'm that's, not sure. that's average though i think that's average is it yeah i just feel like i'm always behind i see people just like banging out books you know well you have to you have to spin more than one plate you know you got to work on other yeah. stuff like if you're going to be doing a longer narrative at the same time you should be doing short stories and yeah. so that way when that longer narrative is done you can also compile the short stories into another short story sure. collection yeah, it's it's definitely an endurance test. I mean, I just look like look at people like uh, Michael DeForge, and I feel like he's publishing a book like literally every year, and I'm no. like, I can't keep up with that. <laughs> I, I really can't keep up with his work anymore. Like, I don't know yeah. what it's he's a been lot up with. of work. Yeah, and it's a lot of it is amazing still, you know. So after so many years, he's just like keeps pumping it out. So, but you know, that's how like, you make a living, though. I mean, you, you yeah. know, if you're going to be a working cartoonist. Um, it's kind of how you have to be. You just have to you be like, push it. very like regular. Yeah, I think Simon was saying something like he's competing with Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, he puts out a book every year too. I mean, you know, I feel like yeah. he just had, what was the book last year? Uh, I can't remember, is it a collection? Uh, Seeds, Seeds and Stems, the collection? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then now he's Crisis Zone out already. I'm Crisis like, Zone. But I mean, he's like, like me, he's like, an intense workaholic like I, he's wor way worse than me i think he just like burns himself out into the ground like yeah. and he's into that and it's like I've, I've talked with him it's like a labor of love and like a love hate it's kind of like um like a like a masochism pleasure is pain thing 
Uh, <laughs> but with Simon Style, I mean, he's like a genius, so he can kind of like come up with these storylines really quickly, I guess, and just work them well, out. Because he has those characters, you know what I mean? Like those characters, he knows yeah. them so well, the stories just write themselves. Exactly. Which is with comedy and a lot of, uh, you know, I know he's really into TV. Uh, it's with sitcoms and stuff like that's where a lot of the humor is from, because you get into the characters and you get to know them and you know how they react to certain situations. And then those situations arise and he's so good at weaving, you know, all these threads together that they all explode at the end. So this so, that's an interesting segue into a question I wanted to ask you, which is, yeah. is do you is this dog character or basically any of the main characters are they actually you or are they like are they a fictionalized um so i i like to joke that i like changed my name slightly the first character where i did that was the dog same i Luani. and i i like to joke that i i changed his name because i was sick sick of writing about myself so i wanted to write about someone else yeah. <laughs> but but they're all me i think um what I'm interested in is like, you know, I don't, I deconstructing identity, like the idea that I, I'm an individual, uh, I dissociate a lot. Like, I, I don't think that the world is real, you know, and reality is real. I'm not completely convinced. So uh, I think identity is a part of that. Like, who am I really? I feel like I'm a confluence of all these social interactions and, and, and forces. Uh, and so, and I change from moment to moment, and I think everybody kind of does. Mm -hmm. uh, so the names are kind of like an, uh, a representation of that. They kind of morph, and each character represents a different aspect of my psyche or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah like the dead, good. the dead Father is a good example because uh, I kind of like, well, I don't know. I always freaking forget. I think it's Eric Byrne, uh, this psychologist. It could be Eric Fromm, but I don't think it's Fromm. I think it's Byrne has transactional analysis and he talks about everybody has a, like a parent and a, a child and like an adult in themselves. And when you're talking with somebody, it's an exchange between the parent or the child and the adult and the adult or the child and the child or whatever. So the dead father, I've got Sammy Alwani, who's like the successful adult billionaire uh, cartoonist and baby Alwani, who's the child. And they're both me um the father is maybe like my own father dead alive inside of me mm -hmm. uh and they like i can use that to to see how they interact and kind of yeah they, they each have their own voice it's like you're saying about uh the characters writing themselves with simon stuff it's like once i ascribe them those personality traits and that psychology then they kind of start to interact on their own and i learn things from the way they speak to each other i guess yeah, that's so interesting. How do you, um, how far ahead do you plan a story? Are you, do you write things out in advance and then just basically draw them or are you figuring it out on the page? So I kind of just, I write everything down that I think. If I have the, the slightest idea uh, for a scene or a piece of dialogue or a scenario, I just write it down and it could be any time of day or night. Like when I did that, uh, another country story in there about the queer utopia, mm -hmm. uh, I was falling asleep and I just, the line popped into my head about, uh, you know, they harvest the energy that powers their cities through uh, eating ass and pussy and, and sucking dick. And, then, <laughs> and I was like, oh, I got to write that down. I wake up <laughs> and scribble it on a piece of paper. So a lot of the time I, I, I rarely sit down and actually like write out a script it does happen once in a while mostly what happens is like i'll get you know several pages worth of writing and then i'll sit down and like conjoin them and like yeah. flesh out the pieces in between mm -hmm. and make sure they all make sense and rearrange them and everything um yeah but mostly and i i think you can see that in the writing a little bit it's like made up of little aphorisms yeah. like little one-liners or like bits of dialogue that kind of get strung together mm -hmm. yeah so that's a lot of what the writing process is for me. And how, how much of this book was previously published and how much it was made for the book? So I think about there's 50 pages of new stuff if you include, or maybe 55, if you include the stuff that was on Instagram because that wasn't published in a, yeah. in a book book. Um, but the American Psycho story was new. The, the, uh, the sonnet poem was new. And then the last 
three stories, the morning diary and the drunken love gouache painting one and atrocity exhibition. I made, I made all for the book. You can kind of feel the tone is different too. Like that was all the last year while COVID was going on. Like atrocity exhibition was like uh, a lot of, for me, a response to the political climate uh, when Trump was in and when all the BLM protests were going on, I got really fired up. So what is your, your relationship with social media though? Are you, are you, are you on top of it? I, I mean, I try and share stuff and a lot of the, like, I feel like it's important because a lot of the opportunities that I got career wise are from people noticing stuff online. Mm -hmm. uh, so I try and post, but I don't really let it control my life. Like I have a friend who's a, a TikTok influencer for Squishmallows. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and she has like 350 Squishmallows, but she's like constantly working on her her squishmallow TikTok, it like consumes her life and she's spending hours a day making these videos which is cool and you know she's doing really well with it uh but for me it's like i i when we're talking about the instant gratification versus the longer denser work that hopefully is more lasting like i'm more on that side i only really want to put something out there if i have something to say mm. uh i don't really want to post something just for the sake of getting the likes and, and posting it. The other thing is I find like, if you, if you sh overshare, mm -hmm. I worry that nobody's actually going to be wanting to buy your, your book later, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like there's a magic that you get when you pick up a book and mm -hmm. you actually sit down and pay full attention to it and read the whole thing cover to cover, or even, you know, several stories in a row and savor them and internalize them and think about them that you're never going to have an instagram because it's just like so fast and nobody really wants to read a lot of text and nobody wants to keep up with like a, a ongoing storyline that's got several elements so a lot of the work that you end up seeing uh and a lot of it is worthwhile and interesting but it's more suited to you know content and like something that you can just digest instantly and uh it's like a i don't know yeah yeah, so, I, the other morning I woke up and I was at my desk and I was just drawing and it was really early in the morning. I woke up feeling kind of anxious, you know, and I was like writing down this comic about feeling like uh, I wasn't prepared. I'm about to become a father in like a few weeks. Oh and my I, God. And I was like writing down about like how like, I don't really know if I even feel prepared for this. How the fuck am I supposed to do this? Yeah. And I posted that comic on Instagram and it was like the most popular thing I did on Instagram. And I, but I, I hesitated to even put it on there because it was just so personal. And it was like, just like in the moment. And then after it became really popular, I just got really self-conscious about it. And I started thinking like, cause for a second I was like, oh, I should just do more stuff like this. I'll get a lot of likes. But then I'm like, I don't want to give this away. Like, I don't want to give, you yeah. know, this is like something that's, yeah. I shouldn't even post it that. Like that, that's like a very intimate private totally. anxiety and I'm giving totally. this away for likes, you know? So I just couldn't follow it up. I just had to move yeah, it. no, I feel, I feel like that's totally valid. Like I, uh, I mean, if you have something, I mean, you know, maybe it's a little bit silly or a reach, but I mean, I feel like art is a very spiritual and sacred kind of thing. It's an experience that is meant to, you know, transform people and change the way they think. And you want the setting that people experience that to be, you know, commensurate with the, the work that you're doing. So if you're just like tearing your heart out and burying your soul in front of people, uh it, you know for for them to experience it in a split second as they scroll it's like it's good in a way because a lot of people get exposed to your work wh when they might not otherwise have mm -hmm. um but at the same time you you don't want to bear it i mean a lot of the stories in my book it's just like i like i drew my ex's full penis like in in photorealistic like watercolor like <laughs> you know was that from was that from memory or did you have him no i have it i have the dildo like here in my in my oh, home. oh i thought you meant his yeah. actual... <laughs> it's from observation um and it's like to begin with you know that touches on another issue which is if i posted that on instagram i would get my account taken down yeah. so there's all this like it's a super far right environment in the first place they're policing what i'm saying and doing and they're selling it for ad revenue uh you know so it's like i don't really always want to put my deepest darkest secrets on instagram there's a sort of work that works well for social media and there's a sort of work that it's better to experience i think in a book and like you know 
make time for reading a book, which is important. It is kind of depressing when you think about like that's the current age where like you have to bare your soul to get any and people are just scrolling past and they go, oh, here's somebody in pain or something. And then they double tap. <laughs> like, yeah, like, oh, here's an expression tap. of somebody's anxiety or whatever. Oh, here's a comic about how somebody's like mentally depressed or like mentally ill, you know, whatever. Yeah. Tap and just keep scrolling. It's like, what that's yeah. kind of horrific. Like that's Yeah, in a way it is. Yeah. I mean, it's like you want to technology is useful as a tool and like you want to use it for what it's meant to be used for. And it's like, I like sometimes to make like a funny four panel joke and put it put it online for people to see. Mm -hmm. But I also, you know, want to make work that affects people in a, a totally different way than that. I don't I don't always think that Instagram is the best place for that mm -hmm. or even the Internet in general. Like it's it's unfortunate that so much stuff is being disseminated through the Internet where people have short attention spans and are not willing to make time for something that's complicated. Um, and, and I think Prince is like much better at that, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Have, do you think there's a, a, a graphic novel equivalent um, as far as like complexity to something like um, Ulysses or something like that? Do you think that could exist? Yeah, I think so. I, you know, that it's funny that you mentioned that specifically because when I was getting into comics, and I was still, you know, I was coming out of like a, a literary arts program in a high school and we were mostly like Eurocentric. So I was I was really into Joyce at the time. I feel like I've expanded my canon since then. But that was the main uh, read was like I was like, I want to see something that's this dense in comics. Yeah. And I think, you know, like at the time, like someone like Klaus was making works that were really you know, heartbreaking or, or, and I see, I see people doing it, but it, it's rarer mm -hmm. than in other media. I think a lot of that is to do with, you can't make a living doing it. So people have to divide their time between five other ambitions while they're working on their comics. Um, but yeah, that's, I, I hope that, that we see more of that kind of work. I, I often think about a, a quote from uh, uh, Borges, a, a short story writer, um, <laughs> And he said that what he liked about the short story was that you could make something that isn't necessarily uh, actually perfect, but appears to be perfect. Like every element is considered and they all work together and are cohesive and there's nothing extraneous in it. And there, it's just like this perfect object. And I mean, I, can anyone ever attain that? No, obviously. But like, it's nice to try, try to strive for that, I guess. Yeah. But I mean, I think what you were saying before, when we were talking about something else, like not letting, you know, when I was saying, I worry that I make things too dense, and you said, don't let society influence what you're doing. I, I think that's important. Like, I mean, I feel like you should just be making the work that you want to make, like, you should be making work that you're excited about and that you feel needs to like be made and happen. So whether you are, you know, making enough money doing it or whatever, you should be making it the way you want it regardless, you know, as difficult as that is sometimes, but I mean, it's there's nice to no, live in an idealistic world. There's no reward. That was the thing that John P told me, like when I first was getting into comics, we go for these walks all the time. He was basically run through what alternative comics were, you know? And that was yeah. the thing he always like put in my head, like there is no big prize that you're trying to attain. Like you don't just like work for years and then you get this gold watch or whatever, like <laughs> something that like you do, like, it's not like you're working, uh, you know, and then, and then you get into the, you know, I don't know, like it, it, it doesn't like, if you start off in comics and you work, that's as good as it ever really gets. You're, you're yeah. in comics and you're working that's like that's all it is <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's like a, for me i think it's like just the idea that people are reading the work mm -hmm. and empathizing with it and like responding to it and uh that's the most meaningful part for me uh if i can interact with people and, and hopefully like change the way they think or make them think about something new that's the the best case scenario i but yeah you can't really expect and it's unfortunate because you know then you push out a lot of artists who don't have you know necessarily the stamina to deal with that kind of life for many years so now here's the here's the real question because you're still relatively new to the comics 
do you think that you've found your voice yet? Well, I mean, I, yeah, I think I have, I think I have, but I mean, I'm open to criticism. Like, uh, I was like reading my Goodreads reviews and I was like, <laughs> and, I, and somebody was like, it feels like he's just experimenting with different voices and trying to find, <laughs> yeah. and I was like, all right, whatever, valid, sure. But I mean, I, I feel like I'm new to comics, but I've been working f since I was a kid. Like I've been writing uh fiction since i was like 15 uh and now i'm almost 30. Mm -hmm. so i feel like i sort of know what kind of work i want to make i don't know klaus in um modern cartoonist that little pamphlet that was published oh, yeah. in one of the eight ball he's, he talks about that because he says that comics it's like you have to wait a long time uh for an artist to master everything that they're doing with comics because there's so many different elements like you have to be an actor and you have to be a designer and you have to be a writer and you have to be an artist and you know maybe i'm not necessarily there yet but it's tough to see people judge the whole book as a unit because it was made over the last like seven years right so a lot of the stuff that i published you know five years ago compared to what i'm doing now i feel like the work that i'm doing now I'm excited about and I feel like this is my voice. I know what I'm doing. Bye.